And this message is called, God Has a Plan. So when we open up the Bible and we turn to the book of Job, it's one of the oldest, it's one of the oldest books in the Bible. It's actually believed to be the oldest book in the Bible. And when you open the Bible and you turn to the Old Testament, chapter 1, it begins there in the beginning. And it tells the creation account in chapter 1, well, who wrote that? Well, it's, it's agreed upon that Moses wrote the first book of the Bible. But it's also believed that Job, his book was written before Moses wrote Genesis. It's one of the oldest pieces of, of Bible that we have, one of the oldest pieces of literature on the planet, the book of Job. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you what happens before I tell you what happens, so then I can tell you what I told you, okay? <laughs> it's what happens. Uh, Job was the greatest man in the East. He was rich, he had all kinds of stuff. In one great catastrophic day, he lost it all. He later lost his health. He, the whole book then thereafter involves a, a dispute or an argument, a sophisticated argument between Job and four of his friends. And at the end of that, God speaks from heaven and He speaks to Job and Job is just humbled and the book ends and Job is richer than ever before. Okay, now that's, that's what happens. That's what I told you and I'm going to tell you about it. We know Job, I mean he's a familiar person from the Bible, and we say, you know, he has the patience of Job. Job was patient, and he, he didn't curse God, and he was faithful through it all. And kind of the key verse that most of us are familiar with is Job chapter, 20, uh, chapter 1, Job chapter 1 verse 21, which I'm going to use for opening text today, where the Bible says this, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Let's pray. Father, we continue to praise you today as we worship both in spirit and in truth. I thank you for your word, for your love, for your mercy, that you do have a plan that you are on the throne. Everlasting, all-knowing, mighty to save. Father, you're worthy of all praise and glory and honor. We praise you and we thank you today. May your word be presented here one more time today in a way that pleases you and brings you glory because the glory is all yours. We pray, Father, continue praying that you grow your church because it's your church and the increase of your church comes from you. No matter who plants or who waters the seed, the increase is yours. I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So when you open up the Bible and you turn to the book of Job, which is right before Psalms, and you find in chapter 1, this is what happens. Satan, uh, Satan appears, we don't get a lot of detail, but this is what happens. Satan appears one day in a meeting. And if you imagine in heaven, God's got this big conference room, okay? And while the angels are assembled, Satan gets in. I don't know how that works out, but that's what Job says, chapter 1. And Job says, I've been, or Satan says, Satan says, I've been going back and forth in the earth to see who I could uh, devour, I guess. That's what he does, like a roaming lion, Peter says about him, seeking whom he may devour. Satan says, I've been there roaming back and forth along the earth. And uh, God, God says, have you considered Job, my servant? And, and Satan says, well, you build a big wall around him. And everything he does turns to gold, man. He's got the Midas touch. You take that stuff away from him. That old boy will curse you to your face. And God said, very well. Take all this stuff away, but don't harm him. Don't harm him. Now, this is the way the Bible opens up. Job chapter 1, first three verses. This is what it says about Job. It says this. It says, in the land of us, there lived a man whose name was Job. He was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. That's ten. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. And what happens is, in that chapter, uh, Satan gets permission from God to take all his stuff away. And what we read in chapter 1, first it says 500 oxen and 500 donkeys they're stolen by the Sabians. 7,000 sheep. The shepherds right there with 7,000 sheep. And what happens? Fire falls from heaven just like a volcanic 
uh, a volcano eruption and fire and brimstone fall from heaven and devours all the sheep, 7,000 sheep, dude, every one of them die. What happens? 3,000 camels. 3,000 camels are stolen by the Chaldeans. Stolen. 3,000 camels. Now I got news for you. You ain't going to get those back at the pawn shop. <laughs> 3,000 camels. They're stolen all in the same day. The ox, the donkeys, the sheep, the camels. And then what happens? He has seven sons and three daughters. And they have this big party at one of their houses. And everybody's in there and they're all partying because they don't know exactly what's happening. But they're all there in one place. And this huge wind comes in and knocks the house down. And just like a pancake, the ceiling comes down. And they're all dead. And you thought you had a bad day this week. This all happened to Job in one stinking day. And that's where we find in chapter 1 all his stuff is gone. He was the greatest man in the East. And now he's got nothing. And that's where we find in chapter 1, verse 21, it says this where we started. <coughs> Job says, Naked I came from my mother's womb. And if you've been there in the delivery room, they come out, man, in a birthday suit. That's all they got. They don't come out with a suitcase, you know. And the way you come in is the way you go out. You may have all kinds of money you can't take it with you. I came in naked, naked I was part. The Lord gave, and the Lord's taken away. By the name of the Lord be praised in all this. Job did not sin. He did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. So what happens in chapter 2? Well, uh, Satan goes back before God. And he says, uh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, God, he says, uh, skin for skin. A man will give anything he, does, he has and he will give up all his integrity for his health. That's what, that's what Satan says. And God says, okay. Because Satan says, if you take his health away, if you take his health away, he will curse you to your face. God says, very well. Take his health away. In chapter 2, verse 7 says this. It says, Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. I don't know, man, if that's chicken pox or some type of other painful bowls, but I know it hurt. They were painful, and that dude had them all over him, from the bottom of his feet to the top of his head. So his, his stuff is gone. His children are dead. Other stuff, some of it's burned from heaven, some of it's stolen. He's got nothing. Now he doesn't even have his health. And his wife is saying in chapter 2, she says to him, says, why don't you just curse God and die? And he says, I will not. I will not curse God. He says, why not? I praise Him in the good times. Why not praise God in the bad times? And the rest of the book, now if you read Job lately, man, that's a hard book to read. you got 42 chapters. And most of that, about 40 chapters, you got the first two chapters that tell what happened to his stuff and his health. And about 40 chapters that follow over his one intense argument. The first 31 chapters are with three friends. And 32 to 37 is with a fourth friend. And then God speaks for four chapters, 38, 39, 40, and 41, and then the end's the summary. But it's a hard book. Now, you think we're smart people. You know, we got iPhones and iStuff and iPads. and We're smart, man. You go back and read the book of Job and, and read that argument that unfolds. These people were sophisticated with great logical arguments. But anyway, here's, here's his friends. Job's friends, he had three that appear in the first 31 chapters. And then one that appears in the later chapters, but it's uh, Eliphaz, the Temanite, Zophar, the Namathite, Bildad, the Shunahite, and Elihu, the Buzzite. Now, if you're looking for nicknames for your toddler, you know, these are Job's friends' names. And uh, Eliphaz, Zophar, Bildad, and Elihu, and they all speak through this book. So when you pick up Job and you're reading and it's, it's hard to read, and some of the stuff they say is true, it's about God and it is true, and some of the stuff they say is false, and it, man, it's hard. You read Job this week, it's hard to read. It's a difficult book to follow. But there's one consistent thread that runs through all the arguments and ideology that, that Job's friends, they all try to, they say this, they say, God is just. God would not pervert justice. God will do what's right. And that means, Job, that means that you have sinned. You've done something wrong. You brought this on yourself. It's your fault. And over 40 chapters, that's what they say. First, it's uh, Eliphaz. He says this. He says, your own mouth. Job, your own mouth condemns you. Not mine. Your own lips testify against you. He says it's your fault. It's, your, it's in your mouth. It's what you said. It's what you've done. He also says this. He says, Chapter 22, verse 5. Job is not your wicked.
forgiven is great. Are not your sins endless? You've done it. You brought it on yourself. What does Zophar say? Zophar says this. He says, if you, Job, if you put away the sin that is in your hand and allow no evil to dwell in your tent, then you will lift your face without shame and you will stand firm without fear. Job, it's your fault. Job, it's what you've done. Job, it's what you brought on yourself. Zophar also says, he says this, what the wicked, what the wicked told for, he must give back on him. He will not enjoy the profit from his trading, for he has oppressed the poor and he's left them destitute. He has seized houses he did not build. Job, that's you. You're a wicked man. That's why this has happened. You've stolen, you've cheated, you've lied. You brought this on yourself. That's what Eliphaz said. That's what Zophar says. What about Bildad? Bildad says this. Job, when your children sinned against God, God gave them over to the penalty of their sin. And we don't know for sure that they were sinning. When the wind blew, see? But Job, it had to be their sin. They had to do it. It was their fault. You see, God wouldn't pervert justice. There's a reason, Job. Bildad says this. In chapter 18, he says, Job, the lamp of the wicked is snuffed out. The flame of his fire stops burning. Terror startle him on every side and dog his every step. Calamity is hungry for him. The wicked. It's you, Job. You're wicked. In this argument that unfolds, Job is being attacked, and these people are supposed to be his friends. And when you've got friends like that, man, you don't need enemies. You know? And Job, this is what Job says. He says, I'm being attacked. Job, he speaks out of chapter 12. He said, I'm becoming like a laughing stock to my friends. A mere laughing stock, although I'm righteous and blameless. I haven't done anything, but they're attacking me. He says, You're all a bunch of worthless physicians. Job, chapter 13, he says this. You, you friends of mine, you smear me with lies. You are worthless physicians, all of you. If only you would all be all together silent. If you just shut up for you, that would be wisdom. He's trying to, he's got, he's trying to say, I, I haven't done it, I am innocent. It's not my fault. And he says in chapter 13, furthermore, he says this, verse 23. How many wrongs and sins have I committed? Show me my offense and my sin. Now this is what Jesus says in John 8, verse 46. Jesus says, Which of you can prove me guilty of sin? And Job says it in chapter 13, verse 23. He says, Where's my sin? What have I done? And you want to know how Job lived? I'd like to tell you. There's a lot of verses. In chapter, uh, chapter 29, Job chapter 29, verses 7 to 17. I'd like to read them for you. This is how he lived. He says, when I went to the gate of the city, Job says, when I went to the gate of the city, I took my seat in the public square. The young men saw me and stepped aside. They show respect. And the old men rose to their feet because I was there. The chief men refrained from speaking and covering with their, with their mouths. They covered it with their hands. The voice of the nobles were hushed and their tongues stuck to the roofs of their mouths. Where whoever heard me spoke well of me, and those who saw me commended me. Now why was he respected that way? He goes on to say verse 12. Chapter 29 verse 12. Because I rescued the poor who cried for help. And the fatherless who had none to assist him. The man who was dying blessed me. The widow, I made the widow's heart sing. I put on righteousness as my clothing. Justice was my robe and my turban. I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. I was a father to the needy. I took up the case of the stranger. I broke the fangs of the wicked and snatched the victims from their teeth. You see how Job lived? This is before, before Moses had recorded the law. And the summary of the law, Jesus said, there's two rules that summarizes the law and the prophets is this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And before any of that was ever recorded, you know how Job lived? He loved the Lord God with all his strength, and he loved his neighbor as himself. This man was holy and righteous and upright. He had no sin. He was harboring no deceit and envy. And he says there in that book, I haven't cheated on my wife. I haven't been unfaithful. I haven't been disobedient. I have served the Lord. In fact, he says. Job says this in, the next, in chapter 23, verse 11 and 12. He says, my feet have closely followed his steps. I have not kept, I have kept to his way without turning aside. I have not departed from the commands of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily bread. Job 
says, I followed him. I followed him faithfully. And his theme throughout the book is this. He says in chapter 13, verse 15, he says, Though God will slay me, though he slay me, yet I will hope in him. And that's Job. That's his stance, and he's being attacked. He's lost everything he had. He lost his health from the bottom of his feet to the top of his head. All his friends are attacking him, and he says, Though God may slay me, I will hope in him. And through this argument, through this argument, Job even gives this idea, this ideology. He says, uh, I, I would like to prove you guys wrong. In fact, in fact, if I could just get a hearing, you know, if you go to court and you file a suit and there's a complaint in any court you choose, and then there's going to be a hearing and the judge is going to hear your case. There's going to be a series of hearings. But Job gives that idea back in the oldest book in the Bible and he says, if, if I can just get the judge on the line, man, if I can just get a hearing, that's what he says. Job says this, he says, even if I summoned him and he responded, I don't, I don't believe he would give me a hearing. But it's that idea, if I could just talk to God, if I could just plead my case, he says later in the book, Job says this in chapter 23, If only I knew where to find him. If only I could go to his dwelling, I would state my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. Man, if I just had a chance to plead my case before the judge. That's what Job says through his book. Well, that's the first 31 chapters. Job loses his stuff. He loses his health. He has an argument with Eliphaz, uh, Zophar, and Bildad. And the words of Job end at the end of chapter 31. But in chapter 32 to 37, there's another guy who speaks. His name's Elihu. He's the youngest and he gets to speak last because he's the youngest. And he goes on a rant there for about a half a chapter about how he's the youngest but he's still wise. I like him. <laughs> he says, I'm young but I'm wise. Listen to me. But really, his argument just, it, it continues what the other three have already said. He, he says this, he says, Elihu says, should God reward you on your terms when you refuse to repent? God doesn't pervert justice, Job. You're saying you're pure and you're righteous and you're holy, but you refuse to repent. You're harboring sin. You're lying somewhere, man. It's obvious. And Elihu, as the argument continues, evidently, because we read about it, there, there are clouds moving in and there's thunder and there's lightning and it all unfolds in the book of Job. And at the end of chapter 37, Elihu takes that idea that if Job, if Job could plead his case before God, it would all be different. And, and Elihu says that's not possible for man to speak with God. That's what he says in chapter 37. At the end of that chapter, he says, Job, tell us what we should say to him. We cannot draw up our case because of our darkness. The Almighty is beyond our reach and exalted in power. Now you've got this argument. You've got Job and his four friends, and the last of which says, God is beyond our reach. And there's this huge storm moving in. And the clouds are dark and the thunder is raging and there's lightning. And at the end of 37, he says, God's beyond our reach. And you know what happens in chapter 38, verse 1? Then the Lord spoke out of the cloud and he answered Job. If you want to hear God speak in the oldest book in the Bible, it's in Job 31, 32, I mean 38, 39, 40, and 41. And what does God have to say? Job's lost everything. He lost his stuff. He lost his health. What does God say? This is part of it. He says in chapter 38, he says, Job, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Where were you? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched the measuring line across it? On what were its footing set or who laid its cornerstone? God goes on to say, he says in chapter 38, he says, Surely you know, for you were already born. You've lived so many years. Now if you've ever wondered, does God have a sense of humor? Do your head like this right here. God has a sense of humor and we can prove it. Job, surely, it's that, it's that verse. Chapter 38, verse 21. Surely you know what I'm asking. You've already been born, man. Look how many years you've lived. Now think about God asking that to us. God who was and is and will forevermore be, who's eternal. And we've been here, you know, a few, gener a, a few decades. How old are you? 
Surely you know how the earth was formed. Surely you know all these answers. You've already been born. What God doesn't say. In four chapters, Job has, he wanted to plead his case. He wanted to say something. He wanted to plead for the judge. He's lost all his stuff. He lost all his family. He lost his health. He wants some answers. You know what God doesn't do in four chapters? God doesn't give any answers. He says, Job, why should I answer you? Are, are you do you demand an answer of me? God says to Job, He says, in chapter 41, He says, Who is able? God says, Who is able to stand against me? Who has a claim against me that I must pay? Everything under heaven, everything under heaven belongs to me. Do I owe you something, boy? Do I need to pay the bill? Do you have a right to have standing here to bring a case to my court? You want to talk? You know what Job says? When God finishes, and you, when you read about that, he talks about mountain goats giving their young and the birds flying and whether they eat or not and who laid and measured the, the foundations of the earth and the stars in the heaven. If you want to hear dinosaurs, it's in the Bible. It's the behemoth in chapter 40. It's the Leviathan in chapter 41. It's a Leviathan is an animal that breathes fire. Do you know that? It snorts with sparks of fire. It's in the Bible. It's Job chapter 41. You should know that. It's there. Job give, or God gives an extensive reasoning for who I am and I'm almighty and I've created all this stuff and I know all these things that you've never dreamed or thought about and who am I or who are you that you should approach me for an answer. And what does Job say in response? He wanted a day in court. And he got it. What does he say? In chapter 42, Job says this. He says, I know. I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. Surely I spoke of things I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me to know. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job is just humble. And he repents of having even opened his mouth. It's things that are too wonderful for me to even know. I was foolish even to talk like that. And he repents in dust and ashes. And when you read the last of the book, Job lives another 140 years. Another 140 years. That's back when, if you remember, Adam lived, Adam and Eve, Adam lived 930 years. Adam did. People lived a long time. Job lived another 140 years. You know what happened? He had ten more children. Seven boys, three girls. He had a thousand oxen, a thousand donkeys. He had six thousand camels. He had fourteen thousand sheep. And when you do the math, it's double what he had in the beginning. And God said to Job, He said, I'm not happy with your friends. I'm not happy with your friends and what they've said. And if Job, if you pray, if you pray for their for your friends, I will hear your prayer. And it says Job died over the four years. And that's the book of Job. And here we are sitting in East Point, Kentucky, studying a story that's been preached and studied and broke, broken down for centuries. And if we come to the most important part of any sermon. It's the part where we say, man, what about me? What does this have to do with me here today? What, that's what the Bible says, but how does it apply to my life today? I was hoping you'd ask. We live in a world of things that we, we try to we try to put the logic in. We try to calculate and formulate. And why did this happen? And, and sometimes we can. I mean, if I wake up with a hangover today, or a headache, a terrible headache, a hangover, maybe it's because I drank a case of beer last night. Maybe it's my fault. If I wake up today and I go to the doctor and I get diagnosed with lung cancer. Maybe it's because I smoked three packs a day for the last 40 years. Maybe that's why. If I get fired from my job today, maybe it's because I was late every day for the last two weeks and when I showed up, I just browsed the internet on my phone. That'll get you fired. Maybe that's what it was. And maybe when we find, when we find stuff that we, can, that we can calculate and make logical, and we say, man, it was my fault. I shouldn't have done that, and I'm paying for what I did. I think that's some of the easy stuff, but I'm here to tell you. You can wake up today with a headache and not drink any beer last night. You can get 
diagnosed with lung cancer and never smoked a cigarette in your life. You know, you can get fired from your job when you're a diligent, hard-working employee that shows up every day, you know. So what do we do when we can't figure it out? What do we do when we're trying to put the pieces of the puzzle together and we're trying to be logical and say, well, this is happening for this reason and this is what it is and this is how it works? And what do we do? This week when, when we went to the doctor, uh, you know, they did the ultrasound, which uh, all of us, I think everybody's had a young and if any time in the recent past, you go in and you have a you have an ultrasound and uh, you can see some on TV and they tell you it's a baby and Maybe you're, you know, more... Maybe you can see it, man. I, I just trust what they're telling the truth. It's something on the screen. You can see it and all. And then they'll turn the sound on. You can hear its heartbeat. And we were there this week. And you know, we were shocked because there had been no physical symptoms at all. We were shocked that there was no heartbeat. And you're just kind of leveled with that kind of news, you know. And sitting in, sitting in the hospital in the room, in the doctor's office, I could hear a conversation in the hallway. And this how it went, how it went along. This young girl was walking by, and one of the nurses said, the nurse said, congratulations, is this your first? And she said, yes. Said, have you thought about what you're going to name it? She said, the young girl replied back, she said, well, she said, uh, she said, I, I've thought about, the door's closed, I had no idea who it was. She said, I thought about naming it after my boyfriend. You know, I don't know why it seems like the wicked are flourishing. I don't know why it seems like seems like their business are prospering. I don't know why it seems like things go well for them. I, I don't. I can't calculate. I can't formulate. I can't bring it into some logical argument to explain it to you. But I trust with Job. That God is on the throne and God has a plan and He has a purpose behind everything that happens. Amen. And what Paul writes in the book of Romans, he says this, Romans 8, verse 28, Paul says this, he says, we know, church, Christians, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him and who have been called according to His purpose. And if you're here today and you're a Christian, man, that's you. God is on the throne and He has a plan and He has a purpose and He is right and He is holy and He is just and He does not prefer justice. You see that. It's a great hope we have. But when I read through the book of Job, I've got to tell you something that's not fair. i got to tell you something man, that ain't fair and it ain't right. What's not fair in this world, what's not right is this. I can look face to face in the mirror and I can see a, a luster and a liar, and a cheat, and a greedy, selfish, sorry, good for nothing, low down man. I've been all the above. And if you look at a woman lustfully, you've committed adultery in your heart. If you're angry with your brother, you've committed murder in your heart. And I've done all the above. And I'll tell you what's not fair, and what's not right, and what's not just, is I can stand here today redeemed, justified, forgiven by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. If you want something that ain't fair, man, What's not fair in this world is grace. And that's what God gives us in Jesus Christ. I meant to say in this sermon, I don't think I did. But I've said it in so many other sermons that you, you know it's true because I say it all the time. The Bible, the Bible's completely, I mean it's true from cover to cover. It's, it's a period of about 1,600 years. It's 40 different authors. And it all fits together in perfect consistency. You've heard me say that, right? And, and the main theme of all the book is Jesus Christ. I, you've heard me say that. Do you head like it's right here? I say it all the time because of this reason. It's true. So you should say, in a preacher, we've heard this message. And God has a plan. You can't figure it out. But God has a plan. He has a purpose. But you tell me, man. You tell me where Jesus Christ is at in the book of Job. I'd like to show you. In Job chapter 9, you want to see Jesus Christ? Job chapter 9. Job says, Job says in his argument, he says, if only, if only there was someone to arbitrate between us, somebody to, me, uh, to mediate between me and God, if only there was somebody to lay his hand on both of us, someone to remove God's wrath or God's rod from me so that terror would not frighten me. 
Have, have you not heard Jesus Christ wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity? Our, the chastisement that brought us peace was laid on Him. Have you not heard 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5? There's one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. Can you see Christ in Job 9? Can you see Christ in Job 16? Look what Job says. In his argument, he says, Even now my witness is in heaven. My advocate is on high. My intercessors, my friend, and my eyes pour out tears to God. On behalf of man, he pleads with God as a man pleads for his friend. Job is speaking in prophetic words, you see. Second, first John, 1 first John chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible says, If anybody sins, we have an advocate. We have an advocate with the Father who is Jesus Christ. He intercedes, he mediates, he's our, he's our lawyer. He's our lawyer in the presence of God Almighty. He's Christ and He is our friend. Jesus said, you're my friends if you do whatever I command you. You see? You see Christ in the book of Job one more time. The last verse of the day. In Job 19, He says this. You want to see Jesus Christ in the book of Job? Here it is. I know that my Redeemer lives. And that in the end, He will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see Him with my own eyes. I am not another. You want to see Christ in the book of Job? We have one who became flesh, who suffered death, who rose victorious on the third day, and we know today He never went back into the grave. He's alive. Our Redeemer lives, and furthermore, we're promised He will appear on the earth. And Revelation chapter 1 verse 7 says, Behold, He's coming in the clouds and every eye will see Him. Job will see Him and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Daniel and David and Nehemiah and Matthew, Mark and Luke and John and even those that pierced Him. Every eye will see Him, even those that pierced Him. The one who was dead, behold, He's alive forevermore. And it gives us hope. I'm convinced somebody here needed to hear the sermon today. Everybody in this room has been affected by, by cancer and car wrecks and accidents and children with abnormalities and everybody in the room has been affected. Well, what do you get for serving God and going to that church and giving you time and giving you money? What does God do for you? We're not promised health and prosperity. We're promised eternal life and forgiveness of sins. What does God do for me? He's doing it every day. We're here today. Strength comes from Him. Life every day. Our family and opportunity to witness for His glory. He's prepared mansions in heaven for you, Christian. You know, what does God do for us? He's at work in our lives through His Holy Spirit every day. God's at work. He's on the throne. He has a plan. Something else, one last thing that's not fair. One last thing that's not fair is people around the world are living and dying without having ever heard of Christ preach. That doesn't seem fair when there are people in this building and others just like it around the country and around the world who have heard this gospel over and over and over again, time and time, again and again. They continue to refuse eternal life and hope and joy and purpose and the forgiveness of sins. It doesn't seem fair to me that you keep hearing it and keep refusing it when other people out there never hear it one time. But God has a plan. And it is fair. And you're here. And you've heard it. What are you going to do today? We're going to sing an invitation hymn. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the Word of God. If you believe it, you can act on it. You've got to repent. You cannot continue living in sin. You've got to turn from sin. Repent of your sins. You make your confession. I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. If you confess Him before men, He'll confess you before the Father and His angels. You're ready at that point to be buried with Christ. That old man's got to go. You've got to die. That old man's got to go buried with Christ in a watery grave of baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. That's for two reasons in the New Testament. The forgiveness of sins, the gift of the Holy Spirit. You can start your life for heaven's sake. That's not the end. I don't have somebody to think, I've been baptized, I'm ready to go. Well, you are ready to go. But that don't mean you quit. It's just a starting line. It's just where you begin your relationship with God, new life. It starts now, it continues forever, Lord. And as we 
we stand and sing if you have decision to make to rededicate your life to become a Christian, I invite you to come as we stand and sing.